Welcome to the Damcasters, brought to you in association with the Pima Air and Space Museum. I'm your host, Matt Bell. Dr. Kit Chapman is a science historian down at Falmouth University and one of my old muckers from History Hack, fantastic podcast run by Alex Churchill. Now, Kit is an incredibly clever chap, and what Kit does very well is explain complex things simply. And today we're going to be talking about nuclear testing, because that's a big subject that he brings to life, as you're going to hear in the episode, in an incredible way. And we're going to be looking at the IV Mike test in November 1952, which was the first detonation of a hydrogen bomb, a thermonuclear device. And to understand just what the heck was going on after the explosion, the United States flew fighters into the mushroom cloud to gather samples and understand just what was in there. As you can imagine, it was a bold plan that didn't quite go to plan. And there were some tragic consequences for it as well. So in this episode, we're going to be looking at what a thermonuclear device is, how big these things are when they go off, and what happened when F-34G Thunder Jets flew into a mushroom cloud. As always, please do stick around for the middle of the pod where we will be regaling you with one of the helicopters involved in today's episode as we visit the Pima Air and Space Museum, who are our fabulous sponsor for this pod. But we have to get straight into this and immediately I'm going to start with some silly questions because I didn't do that well in science and I need Kit to help. Right. So what I normally do is do like a, a, a recorded intro and outro afterwards once we've talked so that it's not like history hack where we start one thing and go yeah, and no off and something else. Um, how do you want to be introduced is the first question. Uh, Dr. Kit Chapman, a science historian based at Falmouth University. Super. Cool. Right. Well, this is where I get to do my best role and play the idiot. So we're going to be talking about big bombs. And I guess the, the thing is, when we are looking at, and with, of course, the, the Fallout trailer dropping the other day, which we're all excited for, for TV and, and half-decent Bethesda game sort of things, when we're talking about atomic and nuclear weapons, we do have a quite a wide variety of them. So we're going to be talking about the IV tests and Mike in particular, but what is the difference between a nuclear fusion bomb and then say one of the bombs that was dropped on Japan, which would have been a thermonuclear fission bomb, if my Googling was correct. Wouldn't be thermonuclear. Thermonuclear is Ivy Mike. Aha, um, see, there it we would go. Be a fission bomb, though. Okay. So uh, let, let's start with basically how these bombs work. Mm. So you've basically got a core, and what you're trying to do is you're trying to explode individual atoms. Now, when you explode an atom, that's fission, um, and basically you're releasing a lot of energy. If anyone knows any equation in physics, it's E equals MC squared. So C squared is the speed of light squared, which is an absolutely massive number. M is mass and E is energy. And so even though the mass of a single atom going apart is tiny, because the speed of light squared is so big, you're getting a lot of energy. Mass times the speed of light squared. So one uranium atom exploding is enough energy to shake a grain of sand but we're not talking about one atom exploding. What we use is called fissile material, and they send out uh, neutrons, particles, and they hit other atoms, and those atoms explode, and so on and so on. They release more neutrons, they explode. And what you get is a chain reaction where you're causing multiple atoms to explode, that's more energy, and that becomes enough to level a city. So the first bomb, uh, which is Trinity Test, uh, that was done uh, 16th of July 1945. Um, that is actually a plutonium bomb that they're using. Plutonium is a little bit heavier than uranium, um, and that means you've got a bigger mass, you've got a bigger bang. The first drop bomb that's used in anger is uranium because it's much simpler to make it go boom. Mm -hmm. uh, plutonium requires you to compress it. Uranium, you can just fire in a neutron and off it goes. So here is showing me that that is a uranium bomb. Plutonium, it's... A, uh, a slightly bigger bomb, that's Nagasaki. Now we're talking in terms of the amount of energy released in, in tons of TNT equivalent. Mm -hmm. So if you imagine one ton of TNT going off, that causes a certain level of boom. For a nuclear bomb, we're talking in kilotons. 
So Hiroshima and Nagasaki, we're looking around 10 to 15 kilotons, 10 to 15,000 tons of TNT going off. When we get to Ivy Mike, this is when we start going into thermonuclear bombs. And the actual difference is, I, mean, I can go into the design a bit later on, the key thing is trying to get more of those atoms to explode. Because these bombs are incredibly inefficient, not enough of them are going up. And so you want more and more of the, uh, the atoms to explode. The more you can do that, the more energy is being released. We also start getting fusion. That's when uh, atoms are joining together. And that releases even more energy which is why fusion reactors are going to be so important. Um, and you start getting that happening in these thermonuclear weaponry. We use isotopes, heavier versions of hydrogen for this, which is why they're also known as hydrogen bombs. And when we do those, we get up into the megatons, millions of tons equivalent of TNT. So that's roughly the differences. You've got a bomb big enough to level of city. What was the argument to go to hydrogen for this? Because this is the Oppenheimer Teller are, are yeah, you, is this, this, is the, this is the classic Oppenheimer teller thing. So Oppenheimer's point was, what is the point of having a bomb that can already level a city? Why do you need a bigger one? Um, and uh, Te Edward Teller is a Hungarian scientist. He flees, flees the Axis, uh, moves over to America. He is the real driving force of this. So much so that he actually creates his separate lab, um, Lawrence Livermore, outside uh, Livermore in, in California, just for him to kind of play around with. And he is really pushing for bigger, bigger booms. And his argument is no one wants to mess with someone who's got millions of tons of TNT. You know, it, it's strategic. But you're absolutely right. At, at, the, at the point, by the end of the 1940s, the bombs we've got are enough to wipe out any city on the planet. What is the point of making a larger one? Teller's argument you know, is, is because it's terrifying, and it absolutely is, as we'll get into but I personally don't see the reason for having thermonuclear weaponry. No, and I completely agree with you. It's, you know, the, within the space of 10 years, we've gone from the dream of precision to the dream of destroying an entire city with, with one weapon, which is, which is madness. I have a few questions before we get into Ivy Mike in particular. And, and one is what we're going to be talking about today, which is the sampling bit. Mm. And in, in some of the material you sent me, the interesting thing was after the Trinity test, they struggled to test what was actually there and they were having to do crater sampling. So what was limiting about drive, some poor sod driving into a crater after a nuclear bomb's gone off and picking up what's left to what they were then going to be trying to do when they move the testing out of the States and, and into the Pacific. What, what are they, what are they trying to find? Is this just because they don't know what's going to be there or they're looking for something particular? So the, there's a, a combination of things there. The, the first is when these bombs start going off, um, Trinity test is, is the first one, as we mentioned, that's in New Mexico, uh, White Sands. Uh, and when it goes off, We've got uh, airplanes circling around. You've got uh, B-29 bombers sort of observing the, the blast. People are taking photos of it. And as you're right, people drive down to the crater and they have a look at where the bomb's gone off and they try and work out the yield. How big was this bomb? Um, and that's only one data point. It's not all of the data points because you've also got to think about uh, where's all this matter gone and what's gone up into the stem. How much has it gone on? How much, uh, how much new neutrons are flying around in there? How much fission did we have? How much fusion did we have? How effective was this bomb in exploding all of the plutonium that we had in the core? Mm -hmm. We need to work all of that out. And you can do that better if you've got multiple data points and you've got data points of the stuff going up uh, into, the, into the sky. So you want to know how much it's worked. There's a term they use in, in, in there called fractionation, um, which I won't go into, but basically they're exploring how effective the bomb is. The other thing is there are weird things that we get when nuclear bombs go off. Um, so there's a material called trinitite, um, which never existed on Earth before we set off this bomb. Trinitite is basically a green glassy substance that exists when the nuclear bomb uh, blast is so powerful, it turns the sand um, of the desert into green glass. Uh, highly radioactive green glass. It's illegal to, you can now go to the Trinity site, it's illegal to take Trinity, uh, Trinitite off the site. You know, people will check for it and, and make sure that you're not nicking stuff off. So there's all of that going on. But what, why, you know, would you, why would you want to nick a bit of radioactive glass? Um, 
<laughs> so there's there's two really interesting things about the Trinitite. One is that um, that people do sell it and people do collect this you know bomb memorabilia for want of a better word. The other thing is that ants, for some reason, are crazily attracted to it. Mm. And so they used to have to go around uh, and try and find ants' nests using Geiger counters to collect samples of Trinitite because the ants would start hoarding it. Wow. Um, which, you know, when we talk about fallout and, uh, <laughs> you know, imagine <laughs> these giant ants emerging. Um, we're not entirely sure why ants do that. So there's all of these interesting questions. The other thing that we don't understand is what's going off into in, in, into the clouds. We didn't know anything about radiation and radiation protection. We didn't know about electromagnetic pulse when we started these tests, which becomes very important later on. Um, and we're hoping that there is fusion. So while most of the energy will be fission, breaking apart, occasionally you will get fusion in a nuclear bomb. And a nuclear bomb is pretty much the same as a nuclear reactor in that respect. Most of the time you're getting fission, sometimes you're getting fusion. It's how we make plutonium. Um, and if you do that, you're making elements heavier than plutonium, which start to be things that do not exist naturally on Earth. You know, the next ones are americium and curium. You cannot find americium and curium anywhere on Earth except they have been specifically made in nuclear reactors or in nuclear bombs. And at this point in time, we're only up to Californium, which is element 98. Uh, plutonium is element 94, so we're four elements up. If we can go even further than that, we can find elements that do not exist on Earth and we've never found before, and there are many reasons we want to do that. See your first book for more on, on <laughs> Absolutely. that. See Super Heavy by Kit Chapman for more details. <laughs> Yeah, this, this this is where I'm, I'm looking up. I think I should have grabbed it and, and had it to, to refer to as we're going through some of this. As smart science teachers will tell you, this was not one of my better subjects. I, th I think you're keeping up. You're doing fine. <laughs> yeah, thank goodness I'm just asking the questions. So one of the big shifts is moving out to the Pacific, moving these detonations. One of the things that always fascinates me is just how many tests they did in Nevada, because it's a remarkable number of of explosions yeah, absolutely. On, on, I mean, on, I mean, on the there ranges. are whole programs of testing, multiple programs of testing in Nevada. And of course, Las Vegas um, becomes a destination because people want to go and watch the mushroom clouds. That's how Las Vegas got its break. Yeah, put everything on black and then watch a blinding flash on the horizon. So let's start talking Ivy Mike. Well, actually, it's a, I suppose before we get onto that, what does an atoll do better than... A desert is it just because it's remote and it's there or can you actually collect better data if you're out in the middle of the ocean um yes there is security so a, a desert nice and secure an atoll you know hundreds of miles away from anyone else is incredibly secure mm -hmm. you know this is basically the most secure place you can find it but of course it is incredibly remote as well which creates all kinds of logistics problems for the united states um, and other countries so there is an aspect there um another part of it is um, while the desert might be where you're setting off the bomb, a wind will drag that radioactive cloud over to cities and people might start fall falling ill. And the last thing the US government wants um, is to have a population that's ill and then suing them um, for enormous amounts of money. So the wind effects are something they're concerned about. Um, an atoll also is a fantastic harbour for shipping. Right? I mean, that's almost, it's almost a perfect harbour in the middle of the ocean. So you can um, use that as a staging pose very neatly. And if you want to experiment what happens when a ship is destroyed by, or bombed by nuclear weaponry, you've got that capability as well. So there are several big tick boxes for atolls. Um, the final thing that you can, you can do, which is really quite simple, is that when the bomb goes off, as I mentioned, there's going to be all kinds of debris and stuff going up in, in the cloud there is simply more random stuff in a desert than there is in an ocean. We know the what the ocean's made of. <laughs> you know. So apart from some of the coral, um, that's a really good reason to do it in an atoll as well. So we're heading out to the Pacific for this. And the name of the atoll is one of those fantastic names which I can never pronounce. It's Eniwetak. And a wee tack. You see, that's why I've, I've got you here. So what, what are the hopes for the test? Because this is the first test of a hydrogen bomb. Yep. So this is tell, Teller's, Teller's moment. He's won the argument and they've headed out to the Western Pacific. 
Yeah, so, so this is yeah. um, this is part of the Marshall Islands. Yeah. Um, the best way to think of it is if you draw a line north of New Zealand and uh, sort of east from the Philippines, where those lines intersect, that's where we're doing it. Fantastic. I shall put something up so that's... Because <laughs> <laughs> that's it, it's terribly remote. It's... You know, it's the con. They're they're having to cover. I remember watching the um the the Ivy Mike original test film, which is weird. It's like absolutely nuts. Yeah, and, and if you've seen any Godzilla movie, that's the bit they always play at the start. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's that big sort of mushroom cloud blooming out. Yes. So, funny enough, I was watching Godzilla clips earlier. Don't, don't ask me why. Um, so what are the hopes for this test? What what are they wanting to do besides, yeah, this a finding out that this thing works. What are the sort of requirements that they're wanting to get out of this test? Um, so the number one is making sure it works. So yeah. um, up until that point, thermonuclear weaponry um, and this idea of hydrogen bombs, completely theoretical. And the actual design of the bomb has only emerged in the past you know, six, seven months, really. Um, it's uh, Teller and uh, a guy called Stanislaw Yulam uh, working together. So it's a Teller Yulam device. And it is uh, something that they've never done before. They're not entirely sure that this works. So much so that the next test along, which is Ivy King, um, they do something completely different um, because they actually don't, they're not sure that this is going to actually have any effect. So they're trying out something new. And the key part of Ivy Mike is how they've actually designed the bomb, this Ulam Teller device. So it's a two-part mechanism. You've got your... Um, you've got your classic atomic bomb, and I, I say that in as if I have any idea how these things are constructed. It is still incredibly classified how these bombs actually work, but we know roughly how it goes. So not, not got, something um, you can Google or just watch Oppenheimer and, and make in your backyard. Then absolutely. It's, it, it, so people have a pretty good idea. Uh, let's put it that way. But there are there are little quirks that we, we're not entirely sure with. So the key part is you've got your your standard. Um, sort of core, your, and that's the bit that goes off first. When that detonates, it's sending out thermal x-rays um, at about 100 million, I was going to say 100 million Kelvin. It, it could be 100 million degrees um, C as well, because you know we're on roughly the same schedule. 100 million degrees C firing out, and they fire down into what's called the spark plug of plutonium. So there's this tube of plutonium surrounded by uh, liquid deuterium, which is heavy hydrogen, um, and that is reaching it in about one millisecond and giving you 50 kilotons of energy pushing through that tube. This is so much energy that the x-rays actually have weight. The radiation actually weighs something. And so you get this massive condensing, it's super densities, even before the shockwave of, and the actual explosion of all the, the fission particles happens. And because of that, you are getting a more complete bang. You are getting an even more complete fusion, uh, sorry, fission. But you're also, because of the way that the, the deuterium is there, the deuterium is there as fuel for fusion. So you're getting this huge complete fission, and then you're getting fusion as well. And this two-stage kind of idea means that the bomb is just huge. I mean, it, it's the biggest thing that has ever been detonated on the planet at that point in 1952. So that was going to be my next bit. When are we and how far after the Russians detonating their first weapon are we talking about? Because this is all sort of playing into the same sort of uh, race here, aren't we? It is. So so, so, so the, the Russians detonating their first weapon, that's first lightning, that's 1949. Uh, we are talking November 1952 for the United States, detonating thermonuclear weapons. So, we're, so we're, we're taking it up a notch, but we also have all of that paranoia of the surprise that somebody else has this thing as well in such a Yeah, and, and to be honest with you, it wasn't too much of a surprise that the Russians would eventually get there. Uh, I mean, uh, unfortunately, a lot of the stuff in the Manhattan Project was leaked. We later found out how it was leaked. Um, various spies. Um, uh, Fuchs was probably the most famous one of them. Um, yep. I think he's even in the movie Oppenheimer. Um you know, it wasn't too much of a, a shock that the Russians actually eventually got there. Um, but almost immediately afterwards, we're talking less than two years, well, less than three years later, the United States is upping the game and going from kilotons to megatons, tens of thousands to millions of tons of TNT. And, and this is the classic one-upmanship you see throughout the Cold War. It's terrifying. The one thing to bear in mind with this particular test 
it is incredibly experimental. The point of Ivy Mike isn't to have a bomb that you could drop on someone else. You couldn't drop the Ivy Mike bomb on someone else. The main reason for that is that it is absolutely bloody massive. Um, <laughs> deuterium is a terrible, terrible thing to have to deal with because to keep it liquid, you have to basically cryogenically freeze it. And so we have got, uh, we are literally nuking the fridge in this one. Um, we have got a giant 20 foot long, seven foot wide cryo chamber with a thermonuclear bomb in the middle of it. And that is what Ivy Mike is all about. So we're going to get onto the aviation bit of this podcast, ladies and gentlemen, if you're actually wondering <laughs> <laughs> when, when, when we're going to get to that, because this is where we start getting into the need for atomic cloud sampling. Mm. And this is where we have incredibly brave, borderline nuts pilots flying into mushroom clouds, essentially. That, that's what we're talking about, isn't it? That, that is exactly what yeah. we have. We have, and I was saying to this just before the podcast, that it astonishes me that we often sort of hyperbolize and say, you know, this person is doing one of the most dangerous things you can imagine. These people are literally flying fighter jets into a nuclear bomb. That is what they are doing. Um, how did it come about? Um, there's, there's quite a, a, a long history of it. So I mentioned Trinity had B-29s orbiting around it. Um, and the B-29 was, as we know, the most expensive project in the Second World War uh, for mm -hmm. the Americans. It had specialized um, modified bombers developed during the, uh, during the initial testing in 1943, specifically so that it could drop nuclear weapons. It was always sort of part and parcel of it. So these B-29s uh, were orbiting. Uh, very famous physicists were also on board those B-29s. Luis Alvarez um, was with Trinity site on a B-29. But the question was, how do you actually find out what's inside? Because I mentioned you need those data points. So you need to get something inside that cloud to work out what's going on. And the first thing they used was unmanned drones. Nice and safe. So B-17s, um, 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 F-6s, I think it was. Uh, uh, and they often crashed, um, couldn't get decent samples whatsoever, even if they were, because they didn't know where they were flying to. So they then started using, um, well, interesting little story. So there's a chap called uh, Paul Fackler, and Paul Fackler does something that you and I probably think is a bit bonkers. Uh, we're, during Zebra, which is the final of the sandstone tests in the 1940s, and Fackler is one of the pilots that is orbiting around the, the nuclear mushroom cloud. He's been told not to go inside because we don't know what's going to happen. And a little spur from the mushroom cloud comes out, and Fackler claims he cannot dodge out the way in a B-29. Um, there is huge debate to this day whether he did this intentionally or not, but he flies through the mushroom cloud. Um, he then... <laughs> It's in his report that he he then flies through a couple of rain clouds to wash down his B-29. Um, <laughs> you're sort of groaning, rolling your eyes, of course. Um, and Those convenient died. rain clouds in the desert. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And then nobody died. Nobody got sick. It was absolutely fine. Um, and he landed. So people go, actually, this is a really good idea. Let's, let's actually fly manned planes into nuclear mushroom clouds. Um, B-29s are used. Uh, there is a B-29 called the Overexposed, which I love the name of. Um, it's that's on, been on the nose, even, even for pilots and aircraft. I know. They're not about subtlety, are they? <laughs> um, I always... Um, what was... what? I'm just trying to remember what the name of the... Uh, the oh, it's the, uh, the Necessary Evil was one of the bombers on Nagasaki. I mean, some of them are really kind of on the nose. Anyway, um, they then think about, well, why don't we use There's non -humans? the fame... Sorry. There's the famous image of the um, the downed airman that's got murder ink uh, painted on the back of his jacket as well. Yeah. It, it, it was, yeah. So, so, Subtlety is not not a strength of of pilots and aircraft. Not like not like today. I mean, that, that's the other thing. It's it sort of completely reversed in that all these. Uh, I was uh, every time I watched Top Gun Maverick, I'm like, I was just trying to imagine how you got the nickname Maverick, because. Mm. As I was gonna say, no, no uh, pilot I've ever known has had a polite. Um, Nickname. Anyway, um, see, see our see our interview with uh, Kim who had the nickname Killer Chick. So you know it's, yeah. it's, all, it's all good. Anyway, sorry, back back to you, yeah. mate. We're moving on. So they try um, F80s and uh, they call Q F80s because they use chimpanzees. 
Um, but this is where we get into the problem. Um, EMP, as I mentioned, electromagnetic pulse, is something that you get when a nuclear bomb goes off. And the chimpanzees didn't know what to do, and the chimps all crashed and died. So eventually we start getting into human testing, and um, there's huge problems with B-29s. They are big bombers. They are not particularly fast, and you want to get in and get out as fast as you can. And there are multiple crew members on board. And so you're increasing the number of people who are potentially exposed to radiation. So they start using fighters, um, T-33s, you've got um, the F-84s, all kinds of stuff being used. Eventually, they do settle on um, on, on the Thunder Jet, though. Which is something I need to do something more on, because the, the Thunder Jet's great. It's big, big Republic ground attack aircraft. It's already a bit of a beast. And um, so it's, it, it's a clever clever choice to do but i suppose one of the things that was interesting reading about it was all the other types of aircraft that they were trying to get their hands on that yeah. <laughs> which lemay was yeah Everything which you can imagine because let, let me what have we got on the list we've got the uh, b36 which is the big convair insane massively big bomber thing which is even slower than everything else why would you want that b47s fast fast bomber smaller crew which is pretty good b45 which is that sort of nuts almost like a Cambry sort of thing as well. But LeMay's not having any of it, is it? So he's he, they're having to resort yeah. to fighters. So he, he nixes all of this like six months out, saying, no, I need it for strategic air command. We're not having that. You can't have these planes. Uh, F-89s, um, F-94s, they haven't got the ceiling <laughs> because we know that this bomb is going to be high. Um, and so we fall onto the F-84 Thunderjet. Um, one of the reasons is it's a jet. So it's moving a lot faster than a prop plane. Um, and bear in mind, again, 1950s, jets still relatively new. Um, F-84 by this point, it has been tested repeatedly in the Korean War. Um, it's worth mentioning that initially it was a bit of a um, a bit of a lemon when it came to a plane. But I think that by Dog, the time... I think is the... the, the... <laughs> But by the time of the, uh, the F-84G, they've, they've got everything sort of more or less sorted out. Um, you can refuel in flight, which is incredibly important when you're over the Pacific. Um, there's an ejection seat. Um, it's got anti-G, uh, which is goodness knows what's going on in that mushroom cloud. Um, transfer of fuel automatically. And it can be modified very, very easily because uh, if anyone who's ever seen one of these, you've got um, it's a long cigar-shaped body, and then you've got your, your flat wings. Some of them did have... Um, uh, uh, slanted wings. I'm Boney's looking at me like I'm some sort of heathen. Swept, song. my dear man. Swept. Yes. <laughs> but these ones have got uh, long, long, flatty wings, and then they've got sort of cigar-shaped fuel pods at the end. And these fuel pods are fantastic for atomic sampling because you can just take the fuel out of them and you can put all your all your gizmos and gadgets in there. And we've got Geiger counters. We have got temperature gauges. We've got electronic distortion uh, equipment. We have got basically everything you could imagine to detect what is going on in there. And we've also just got lovely little nets and filters. And these filters can just scoop up whatever nonsense is in your mushroom cloud and come bring it back to base and you can analyze it. The F-84 Thunderjet is perfect for this kind of work. So the, the filters and the collection things that they're bolting onto the, the wings of the, the Thunder Jets are essentially just big scoops. We're not talking anything particularly fancy. There's they're yeah, just trying yeah. to collect because they don't know what's there they're just going to be collecting everything that goes through yeah the best way i could describe it is like it's like a pool filter okay mm -hmm. so it's it's just whatever's flowing through there it's going to gather it up and it's going to catch it and it's really nothing more complicated than that um the actual sensor equipment as i mentioned there are several other sensors for things like um uh, radio radiation and uh, and temperature and that does mean that you've got multiple gauges so these pilots went through a series i mean it's 16 different training um programs and missions that they end up going on before they're even allowed to be part of testing um because they are not just flying a craft through a nuclear bomb <laughs> and bear in mind that, that is not easy there is a lot of turbulence in there um but you're also monitoring multiple gauges simultaneously while you're doing that. You're activating the collection uh, because you've got uh, little doors on them. You've got to open those up and actually scoop them. Um, and of course, watching what you're doing in terms of fuel and, and everything else that's going on. So this is an incredibly difficult job. This is not something that's easy. And also you've got to be, uh, I think, a little bit bonkers to want to fly into a nuclear bomb. 
A little bit. <laughs> a bit of an understatement. Um, what sort of kit were these guys given? Because they don't know what they're going to be flying into, but they're going to know that it's a lot of radiation. Were the aircraft modified with lead or were they given anything to try to help them in any way? Yeah, they were. So um, there's multiple things that sort of go on um, in terms of, of minimizing radiation risk. Uh, when they're actually on the ground and they're removing the samples, it's, it's done by guys called decon grunts, decontamination grunts. And they are actually collecting things with a 10 foot pole. They're literally you know, not touching the aircraft. The pilots have to be trained to get out of the aircraft once it's landed and not touch the sides so they don't get any radiation. Um, but they are given some basic equipment. They are given uh, lead line gloves and lead line jackets, um, which the idea is to obviously protect against radiation. Um, lead is a fantastic protector against radiation, particularly uh, when we get beyond alpha. So alpha radiation, you can block with a piece of paper, very, very easy. Beta, gamma, a little bit more difficult. And this is the idea of trying to keep them alive. Um, what it doesn't do, uh, and they don't have, is any kind of protection through their breathing equipment which is something that the US was aware of and they were concerned about. And of course, later on, it would emerge that many of them would develop cancers later in life. We'll come back to that. And let's talk about the test itself, because this is not a few guys on an atoll with a very big bomb, as you said. Ooh, no, 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 this no, no. is a <laughs> lot of kit dedicated to this test. Yeah. How big are we talking here? Um, I mean, we're talking 9,500 military personnel, 2,300 civilians. We're talking a small city. We're talking the size of, um, you know, an average attendance at Crowing Cottage. Um, oh, that's a bit harsh. <laughs> <laughs> it's more than that now, my dear child. <laughs> um, the bomb itself, 74 tonnes. Uh, and most of that is cryogenics, as I mentioned. You've got all that. But you've also got the sampling equipment and multiple stations around. They are creating artificial causeways to link the islands on the on the atoll because it's a series of little islands. The bomb is actually going to go off on a place called Ujalab, um, which will be important later on. Um, and so there is just... It, I mean, it's, it's a, the circus is suddenly arriving on, on this remote atoll at the very end of the Marshall Islands. It is a huge program and so that anyone any kind of and they've got to build runways down there so the planes can take off and bear in mind anyone who knows anything about the f-84 it's renowned for having a long takeoff you know you need a massive strip um there is all kinds of work going on so we're going to have new air bases we're going to have sh reasonably short ranged aircraft f-84 is massively underpowered that's why yep. air refueling was so important for it one of the things that was in, in those old documents was a lot on the command and control. So they are putting a lot in place to ensure that outside of the blast range, the aircraft can be refueled, can loiter, can get in, get out, refuel again and return yeah. home. We, yeah. We've got electric beacons. We've got refuelers. We've got uh, command and control from a B-29. We have got uh, command and control from um, Navy as well. So there are multiple ships in the area. They're about 40 kilometers off the bomb site. Um, it is a coordinated investigation scientific investigation conducted by uh, u.s army u.s air force u.s navy u.s intelligence this is you know sort of cooperation between the forces writ large it is not just a bombs going off and a couple of air people are flying around it is it's far more uh, elaborate than that was there any idea for the crews what they were going to be going into we, we sort of talked about the sort of skip skimming the edges of of the the earlier tests but was this really a case of you know, the, the, the classic Black Adder gag about, you know, here's your map, fill it in as you go, sort of thing. Is, is, are, are we sort of speaking that, or did they have any idea about what, what they were about to, to, to get into? I mean, the answer is yes and no. So did they have an idea about what they're testing? Yes, because obviously, as we mentioned, Nevada test site, people have already started flying into nuclear bombs at this point. Mm -hmm. You know, we have got experience of people going into, into that environment. Um, no, because no one has ever set off a thermonuclear device. We just have no concept of how big this is going to be. And that becomes really, really important uh, when the bomb actually goes off because all of the plans they had, um, this neat, it was a very neat plan. So uh, they would have three flights, uh, red, white, and blue. Uh, red would head off about 90 minutes after the detonation, fly in, um, and you're going through the top of the mushroom cloud of the plan, fly out, refuel with the destroyer, uh, over the, the, the destroyer. Um, they would sample uh, by flying into the cloud, and then fly back to base. There's a, a beacon so they can find their way in the Pacific. 
really nice easy. White would be three hours after the blast, blue would be four and a half hours. So that was the plan. Um, the problem is that when the bomb goes off, um, that plan suddenly seems rather uh, amateurish compared to what they need. So let's talk about when the bomb goes off. So it's, what's the date? 1st of November, 1952. 1st of November, 1952, back in the US, it is Halloween, because bear in mind, we are across the international dateline. Um, test itself is uh, 0715 local time. And the bomb goes off. Um, it is bigger than anyone has ever seen before. Uh, it is 10.4 megatons, 10.4 million tons equivalent of TNT. This is a blast that, unlike the world has ever seen. Um, what, what what were they expecting? I suppose they didn't what, know. I mean, and bear in mind so they hadn't a, they hadn't done any rough back of the fag packet sort of calculations. The problem with the back of the fag packet calculations is that they're so varied. So they didn't even know this bomb was going to work. Bear in mind, Ivy King, as I mentioned, is a is a fission device, classic fission device. It's huge. Um, it's about five hundred kilotons, um, but. It's just not in the same league as Ivy Mike. But I, I always think about the Trinity test in the night before. And um, Enrico Fermi, a uh, very famous scientist, was going around the soldiers taking bets on how big the, uh, the blast would be. And he was telling the, the personnel who didn't know anything about science that there was a good probability the sky would catch fire and the entire world would burn. Um, which is, you know, lovely, friendly, cheery thought uh, to hear from your, one of your lead scientists. <laughs> Um, so, you know, Edward Teller had had predictions, Oppenheimer had predictions, and we were ranging from um, not even kilotons right up to sort of 15 kilotons. There was a massive variation with Trinity. The truth is, while we had a rough idea, it hoped it would be megatons um, with, with Teller, no one was entirely certain. But, you know, 10.4 million tons equivalent of TNT, that is one heck of a blast. And 77% of that... Um, you know, about good three quarters. That is fission. That is that is the classic fission um, explosion. Twenty five percent of it, give or take. That's fusion. So we've got a huge blast there. It is so successful. That Edward Teller over at a Halloween party in uh, in in San Francisco that evening, he gets a seismic reading on his uh, on his on his scales, and he knows the bomb has gone off. Um, and he immediately telegraphs someone, it's a boy, even before news has reached America, because he's able to, to detect the seismic shift. Um, to give you an idea of how big this bomb was, sailors 40 kilometers away on the ship reported a heat of 180 Fahrenheit um, wow. hitting them. <laughs> yeah, you're looking at me baffled. You know, we're looking in 50, 60 degrees uh, Celsius suddenly hitting you. Trees are scorched. At the, at the edge of the atoll, 17 miles away from this bomb. Um, Ujalab, the island itself, I mean, this is one of those classic things. If you find any Wheatsack atoll uh, on Google Maps, you can very easily try and guess where Ujalab is. It's that big blue circle where an island has very clearly been blown <laughs> off the map. It literally does not exist anymore. There is just a hole, a dark blue hole. The mushroom cloud... Um, it reaches 56,000 feet in 90 seconds. By the end of its moving up, it is 130,000 feet, the actual cloud. It is 100 miles wide, and the stem is 20 miles thick. You know, this is an explosion on a scale that you cannot possibly imagine unless you have seen it. And of course, that's thrown all the plans out because that's it's, higher than the operational ceiling of the aircraft. They're already at the limits of their range, and they've suddenly got this thing which is ginormous sitting in front of them. Absolutely. It, yeah. it just throws everything into chaos, because bear in mind, Red Flight, the first guys in, they're, they're supposed to go in 90 minutes after um, detonation. So they're already flying out, they're already refueling, and now they're circling going, uh, guys, should we be going in? What the hell are we doing? They're using up fuel that way. Um, they're also faced with the prospect of, because the operational ceiling is higher than, than even the, uh, the F-84 can go, they have to fly through the stem. They have no option. And so they are going to go through where all of the coral and the debris and the SpongeBob SquarePants bottom of the ocean stuff is, and that is the stem. 
So this is not just a, a matter of flying through radiation and intense heat and pockets of all kinds of nastiness and electromagnetic pulses. It is flying through clouds of debris and dirt. And this is very, very difficult for a early jet engine. Be very difficult now. Yeah, yeah, it, to, it, yeah it's, we, it's, it's bonkers that they even went in, but but lo and behold, they did. So we're going to get on to Red Flight now, talk about Virgil Moroni um, and that. But in that very weird fourth wall breaky documentary film that the Navy <laughs> made, so I'll, I'll put the link in the description. It's so weird. It's like literally us having a conversation and then a guy turning to the camera and going, now join us as we explode. It's, it's freaky. Yeah, and then you've got little bits that have been redacted still. Mm. So it's very clear they were saying even more stuff that you can't read. Mm. It's a fascinating yeah. document. I, I, whenever I watch those things, I always think that there was so many guys that must be the, like writers from Hollywood in junior levels that have gotten sucked into national service and things. <laughs> and, yeah, they're working out a lot of things. But there's a helicopter flight as well isn't mm. there, that, yes, that there goes is. out to have a look to see what's there. Those guys, big balls, is uh, all I, I have mean, to say. Yeah, I mean, flying a helicopter in 1952, probably big balls, mm. to be perfectly yeah. honest. Um, <laughs> but you are now <laughs> flying to where a, where the, the, the greatest explosion has ever happened in human history. Yeah. Um, go find the island that's not there anymore. <laughs> yeah, go find the island that's not there. And they're going out there to find whether or not the island still exists. Mm. Um, and surprise, surprise, it doesn't. Um, the bomb casing, the uh, the buildings, the testing equipment, the causeways that they built, uh, there is just a big old hole in the ocean. Um, and <laughs> what do you do? You know, the only thing is to fly back. We're going to take a quick break so that we can get the latest from the Pima Air and Space Museum with Head of Collections, Andrew Bowley. Here we are at the Pima Air and Space Museum with one of our two uh, Sikorsky Dragonflies. The Dragonfly was one of the first helicopters to go into service with the US military, the Air Force, the Marines, and the Navy use them. This one was used by the Coast Guard. Um, it was the first helicopter used by the Coast Guard. They were heavily used to kind of set up doctrine for search and rescue for the Coast Guard. So a lot of what went forward with more modern and powerful helicopters after this was all stuff that they learned using the Dragonfly. Um, this one did do a, a stint on one of the Coast Guard icebreakers because um, they usually had helicopter support with those. It's interesting to take a look at these earlier helicopters that used World War II style piston engines like this one had a Pratt & Whitney R98. So it limited a lot of the payload these types of helicopters could take. So it really was until you started having turbine engines and helicopters, like starting with helicopters like the Huey, that helicopters were actually able to start carrying larger amounts of troops and carry more equipment and more crew, weapons, etc. But this is one of the ones that started it all, like with the Bell and some of the other early helicopter designs. To learn more about what is on display and what events are coming up at the Pima Air and Space Museum in Tucson, Arizona, please do check out their website at www.pimaair.org. And now, back to the show. So they're flying back. Moroni and Red Flight are going in. So Virgil Moroni is a very experienced pilot. He's a nine victory ace on Republic's previous aircraft, the P-47, back in the, the Second World War. Yeah, very what, good Yeah. Ser seriously, we'll, we'll put some links in about him. He had a, a fantastic and interesting, varied career. Yeah, and um, then, uh, later on in the Vietnam War with his son as well. I think mm -hmm. his son gets shot down in the Vietnam War. Yes. Yeah. I think so, yeah. Um, what happens when he starts flying into the cloud, what does what does he experience? Okay, so um, Moroni, as we mentioned, incredibly experienced pilot, and he's flying in for about five minutes. I mean, he's not sticking around in there. He's flying in there, getting his stuff and flying out. Open up the wings. He describes that it's a red glow like the inside of a red hot furnace inside this cloud. Um, and the only thing that I can try and uh, sort of give you a conjured picture of is um, it's sort of like 
you know that bit in Flash Gordon when they're flying through those red clouds and it's all kind of you know, the, the the camp. It's it's like that, only real and hot and radioactive, and there's dust storms in there. It's a raging dust storm in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. So he's got three radiation instruments in his cockpit. He immediately responds. They spin like uh, they sweep like the second hand on a watch. I mean, these things are just sort of going up and up and up and up. By five minutes, the radiation instruments hit the peg. They have hit the maximum. And he's like, I am out of here. Um, he's got his wingman, which is red too. And they fly out of there. There is simply nothing more that they can possibly do. He breaks free of the sermon. He pairs up with his wingman and he orders the next two in. And that's uh, Bob Hagen in red three and Jimmy Robinson in red four. Um, and Moraney orders them very clearly, a final warning, don't go in too far because this is this is the most dangerous place on earth. So they're going in singly or are they going in as pairs? So they're going in as pairs. So as I say, paired up, uh, red, red one and red two, and then you've got uh, red three, red, red four. The problem is you cannot keep in formation when you are struggling to fly through the stem of a nuclear mushroom cloud. It's just not possible. Um, and as we'll see for the for the second pair, not possible, even if they could have done that. Yeah. And, and again, we've got two guys in Jimmy Robinson, Bob Hagen, who are experienced. They've not selected rookies for this sort of thing. Um, things don't go as well for the second pair in, do they? They don't. Um, so Bob Hagen, as you mentioned, very experienced fighter pilot. Jimmy Robinson, very interesting career trajectory. He was actually on Liberators in the Second World War. Mm-hmm. Um, and he was a bombardier. So he actually made the switch to become a pilot and, and end up becoming a fighter pilot. Um, Moroni and uh, Robinson were also uh, prisoner of war uh, veterans. So um, I can't remember where Moroni was shot down, but uh, Robinson was, was shot down on a mission over Romania. Um, so both of them had, had that experience as well. Yep, it was one, um, uh, Robinson was on one of the Palestine raids, wasn't it? One of the, the low-level jobbies. Yeah, That's right. He was mm-hmm. he was in Dazzling Duchess uh, for, mm-hmm. for bomber fans. Um Anyway, so they go in and, I mean, almost immediately, everything is exactly as Moroni's described it. You know, Hagen's, uh, and Hagen's response is very similar in terms of it's still red in here, it's still a furnace. And Robinson um, almost immediately runs into trouble. He has a pocket of um, radiation directly in front of him. He knows he has to avoid it. He makes a turn to do so and he stalls. Um, and suddenly he is plunged, plummeting um, down to 20,000 feet by the time he recovers through a nuclear mushroom cloud, um, which I can only imagine is, is one of the most terrifying things. We do have um, some comments, heavy breathing, for example, because he was hitting his radio, struggling with the, uh, with the yoke, trying to, trying to get out of this, this stall. Um, he does manage to do it. He manages to recover. They've got the data and they immediately get out of the cloud. And Hagen and uh, Robinson try and form up. They find each other. But the problem is, as I've mentioned, electromagnetic pulse, all of their you know, detection equipment trying to find the, the beacon is scrambled. There is no sign of the refueling plane in sight. They just don't know where they are. And the mushroom cloud, by this point, as I said, it's spread over 100 miles. Uh, we've now got rain clouds moving in here. Um, it's incredibly difficult to find anybody and Hagen and Robinson, essentially, they are flying blind around the Pacific Ocean, trying to find some way to find their way home. It's just awful. Um, they do eventually manage to pick up the beacon for the um, the, air, the airfield um, at the end of Ujilab, not Ujilab, anyway attack. <laughs> they do find it on anyway attack. Yeah, I was going to say trying to land on Ujilab at that point would have been a very difficult. Um, very wet. Yeah, very indeed. Um, so they do find uh, the landing strip. But by this point, they are running on vapors. They, they just don't have any fuel. Um, uh, Hagen um, runs out of fuel pretty much as he hits the tarmac. Uh, he's going first. Uh, he actually bursts his tires uh, on landing. Um, he gets essentially a crash landing, but he's on um, he's on the on the tarmac. He's on on land. Robinson's following up, and Robinson is out of fuel. Um, three and a half miles out, he's basically gliding. He realizes he's not going to make it. Uh, he he has two options at this point. Um, he can either try and bail out, but the problem is he's already too low, um, or he can try and land in the sea. Um, it looks like he tried the first one. First of all, he was he was going for it, uh, and then he decided actually he was going to make a sea landing. 
The problem is uh, that it doesn't go very well. So the emergency, the rescue helicopter is basically rushing out to him as he lands. The problem is, as we've mentioned earlier, Robinson is wearing a lead-lined jacket. Um, and if you land in the sea and, you know, there there isn't much you can really do for someone who's in a lead-lined jacket. So by the time the, the, uh, the helicopter arrives there, uh, there is nothing much more than his plane sinking and they never find uh, Jimmy Robinson's body. But they are able to recover his samplers. They are able to recover the samples from uh, the, the craft. And there is some uh, controversy as to whether or not it was from the samples of Jimmy Robinson as well that they managed to get. Uh, but I have spoken to people who, are, who know a little bit more about that particular test than the official records. And, um, and there is a suggestion that, yes, they were able to recover those filters. Because of the nature of this test, Robinson's death—I don't want to say covered up, but he, you know, he doesn't—he doesn't get a memorial in, in Arlington till till many many years later. It's yeah, it's it, one of those things that it's it's too secret to to be able to to talk about what actually happened. It's it's also uh, the, the big problem is 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 less secrecy and more bureaucracy. So mm, he okay. is awarded the Distinguished Flying Cross almost immediately, which is presented to his widow a few years later. The problem with getting him a, a place at Arlington, and I'm glad to say that he does have a place now at Arlington. Um, I've actually visited it. He gets his place in 2002, 50 years um, after this happened. The problem is that no one knows who this falls under um, because at this point, everything is very much ad hoc. While we've got a lot of um, sort of test um, um, squadrons, things like that, um, and the 4925th four um, Test Group Atomic uh, from Special Weapons Command, uh, 4926 Air Sampling Squadron isn't set up till the next year. And those are the ones that are going to carry on doing this. So it's, it's a bureaucratic black hole. And that means that Jimmy Robinson does not get his place in Arlington Cemetery until the campaign of his daughter, Becky Miller, um, who is a wonderful lady. I've spoken to her. She does a lot of veterans work um, in 2002. So what have they found? Because these guys have flown into hell on earth, or hell in the sky, I suppose, and they've captured a lot of stuff. And this is where elements 99 and 100 on your big chart come in. Yes. So I mentioned earlier that fusion is basically moving one place up the periodic table. Um, and I won't go into the hows and whys of it. It's about to do with protons, and, and this is an aviation podcast, and I'm sure you can care less. Um, one thing they've scooped up is plutonium-246. So this is an incredibly neutron-rich isotope of, of plutonium. Um, isotopes are basically variations of, of, of elements that have got more or less neutrons. This one's got loads and loads of neutrons. Um, they calculate from that that there must have been 10 to the 24 neutrons per square centimetre in that cloud, which is bonkers. I mean, that is just, you know... That, that's a um, lot of zeros. That is an awful lot of zeros. That is 10 to the, you know, 10 to the 24. Awful lot of zeros. Um, I'm just trying to work out, what is that, is that a billion, trillion, trillion? So it, it's an it, it, astronomical figure. Um Lots and the scientists that it comes back to uh, Los Alamos, uh, which is where they're doing the, the investigations. A sample of it also ends up at Berkeley, and Berkeley realizes very quickly that if you've got plutonium 246, you must also have plutonium 244. And plutonium 244 is a very weird isotope because while plutonium doesn't exist naturally on Earth, it's got far too short a half life. Um, which I won't go into, but basically radioactively it breaks down. Plutonium-244 has a half-life of 80 million years, um, which means that theoretically, if you've got enough of it, it could be from the origins of the solar system. We could we could actually find some stuff. And later on, uh, a scientist at uh, Los Alamos does find some plutonium uh, from the origins of the solar system uh, in a different rock in a meteorite. But we're getting off of, we're getting off track. From that sample, that sounds like a fun podcast to do. We'll we'll come we'll come. I was going to say it's then. completely separate, completely <laughs> different thing, but uh, we'll, we'll move on from that. The Berkeley team, uh, Glenn Seaborg and uh, Al Giorso, uh, they are the guys that have discovered these Americium and Curium. Uh, the next ones after Americium and Curium are Berkelium Californium. So it kind of gives you a hint <laughs> of what they've been doing, um, and they realise that if you've got ten to the twenty-four neutrons per, per, per square centimeter, you must 
absolutely must have made Amory, Centurion, Berkeley, and, uh, and Californium, and then maybe the next one after that as well. What's beyond Californium? We don't know. We haven't discovered it. That's element 99. And what maybe we made something even beyond that. That could be element 100. So they start getting samples and they start analyzing it with Los Alamos. There is a big hoo-ha over Christmas because various labs, everyone wants these samples. Everyone wants a bit of the filter. Everyone's claiming they found all kinds of stuff. In the end, um, Berkeley are able to partner with Los Alamos and they officially claim elements 99 and 100 from the samples gathered by Red Flight. So Jimmy Robinson has potentially become the first person who died discovering new elements. Um, and the elements are named Einsteinium, after Albert Einstein, and Fermium, after Enrico Fermi, who we just mentioned. Um, they are on the periodic table for the rest of time. Uh, these are the only two elements that have been discovered, to my knowledge, uh, by airplanes or involving airplanes, and they are the only two elements that have been discovered by atomic bombs. Um, but it is quite an astonishing legacy um, for people, incredibly brave people, who flew into a thermonuclear mushroom cloud. So, ladies and gentlemen, when you think back to those chemistry lessons and things in the big chart on the wall, those ones in the bottom right corner, bottom right corner? Yeah, they'll be the bottom right, yeah. Yeah, were discovered by very brave men in interesting rickety Republic tactical fighter bombers flying into a mushroom cloud. Let's wrap up. When does all this get made public? Because I'm guessing the test itself would have been public reasonably soon. The discoveries, though, would have taken a while to, to get out. Yeah, so the discovery... So as I mentioned, there is there is an academic bun fight... Uh, for want of a better reason, a better love, word love, for love it. an epic academic bug fight. You guys <laughs> do that very well. So that's going on in 1953. Um, these elements actually start for first appearing in 1955. Um, so it's relatively soon. Oh, and okay. the reason is that the Swedish um, do a completely different approach and they discover elements 99 and 100 and go, ha ha, we found it. Um, to which the Americans have to very tacitly sort of respond, we found it by other means. <laughs> <laughs> and we did it a couple of years earlier. <laughs> to which point, everyone knows exactly what they're talking about. So, yes, Ivy Mike, um, you can't keep a secret. I mean, this is the one thing I always find hilarious about conspiracy theories about the moon landing. You cannot keep 10,000 people quiet. It's just not possible to do that. Um, so um, everyone knows about the testing. Um, everyone knows what's going on. The thermonuclear device. There is no point having a thermonuclear device and not telling uh, you know you, you, the uh, the Russians about it because the whole point is to intimidate and scare the pants out of them. Um, so they're very very quickly re re revealed the elements. As I mentioned, the discoveries um, we're looking a couple of years, but everything is pretty much out in the open by 1955. What happens to the crews? Because I was able to see that Moroni only makes it to to 59 and, and dies of cancer in, in 1980. Yeah. I'm guessing that's a, a relatively common story for these. Chaps, because they it must is. have been taking huge doses in those clouds. Um, it, it is one of the the tragedies of the the twentieth century when we look back at, um, at what could have been done and, and the various things that really should never have happened. Um, it's not the only place where we see that in in nuclear um, development. Um, the Hanford site mm. is in, in Washington is notorious as probably the most nuclearly polluted place on the planet. It will take over a billion US dollars to clean up. Um, People have developed cancers. Um, many of the people who saw the first Trinity test developed cancers. Uh, Richard Feynman would be a good example there. Um, and many of them die in, in other ways as well. So you're right. Um, Virgil Moroni um, dies relatively young uh, from cancers. We know that many of the other pilots who, who went in uh, on these, even if they were given a clean bit of health, and they did try and, and monitor them. I, I mean, I should point out they tried to limit the, the, the amount of exposure they get in in Rutgens, um from these tests and, and put limits and things like that. But the reality is, when you are dealing with people who are flying into mushroom clouds, there is only so much safety you can do. It is always going to be an incredibly perilous profession um, to have for a job fly into nuclear bomb. Um, so. 
Unfortunately, many of them uh, do develop cancers later in life, and there are many campaigns, not just from uh, people who were involved in the testing, but also people who lived downwind, uh, people who were located nearby, people who were forcibly moved and ejected from their homes um, so these tests could be carried out. And ultimately, um, I'm just I'm just glad we never actually used one of these things mm-hmm. because if if a new, if a thermonuclear bomb was ever used in anger, um, it is it is game over for all of us. Because it gets to that point where the Russians were Tsar even scared themselves with these things, isn't it? Oh, the, the yeah. Tsar, I mean, there's famously there's there's what's called the Tsar bomber, uh, which is seventy megatons, I think it is something ridiculous like that. There is no point for that re- weapon. I mean, they actually get to the point where they're saying, why are we even doing this? Uh, and there is a reason that we haven't developed nuclear bombs beyond the 1950s in terms of technology. Um, there are obviously refinements. We now use lithium rather than deuterium, things like that. Um, the simple answer is, it is the one thing in human history that we've got so good at, we've had to stop. Because there is no point making a better bomb. I think that's a good place to wrap it up, because okay, okay. what? Why? No, no, I mean, it's it's why it's why, why why that? What better way to to say the futility of of this and yeah you know, the the amount of people you know because there's um, there's just been the um, the recognition for the the British um, nuclear test yeah, survivors yeah, I mean, as as well. This is something that's living with us now. It's yeah, this, it, this, it this continues to this day. Living yeah. memory. Hmm. Um, and, and, and as I mentioned, you know, Becky Miller, um, who's Robinson's daughter, who was, she, was actually, she wasn't actually born uh, when he died. Um, she was, uh, her mother was pregnant at the time. The other thing, we often forget, these are young men. You know, mm-hmm. We're talking yeah. about men in their 20s doing this, um, which is just astonishing. Um, but yeah, this, this is events that happened within living memory. There are people who witnessed uh, Ivy Mike test who are still alive today. And it's just, we can't afford to forget it ever let's change tact a bit what are you working on at the moment because that's all terribly exciting if you're allowed to talk about it but pimp, pimp the books as well because they're both great fun and thank you um, very much so um my, my first book is super heavy uh, which talks about why we're making things like plutonium and and obviously the story of uh, i mentioned of americium and, and fermium is in there but my particular interest is what's called the super heavy elements. So the ones we're making now and the one we just, ones we discovered just a couple of years ago, why are we still making elements? What are we trying to do there? Um, and if you're interested in the science of the periodic table, um, it's a very niche but very interesting little book, I think. Um, my second book is Racing Green, uh, which is about technology in Formula One and other motorsports particularly uh, green technology and how these technologies have have spiraled out from motorsport to help sustainability. I also look at things like how Formula One helped during the COVID-19 pandemic and and helped save lives. And I'm currently working on a book um, that's sort of tracing back the origins of chemistry and alchemy uh, all the way back to um, ancient Egypt and uh, and China and, and a bit beyond as well. And if people want to learn more, what's the best way to keep up dated with you sir the best way is you can go to my website which is the unoriginal kit um <laughs> or you can follow me on twitter at chemistry kit all the links will be in the description below kit it has been too long we need to meet up for a beer soon absolutely and thank you so much for this this has been fantastic and the numbers weren't too big i think i got it I cannot thank Dr. Kit Chapman enough for joining us here on the Damcasters. I found that absolutely fascinating. And the steps that go into these world-ending devices, why do we have them? It's just, it it blows my mind that these things are still around. Because when you look at the old footage of the tests, and I'm going to put the description to that, rather mad documentary the US Navy made in the description below. It's nuts. And it's cost so many people their lives, not just Jimmy Robinson. Yeah, it's not good. But buy Kit's books. They're great. Super Heavy and Racing Green are both superb. Links to them are in the description below, as his website and his Twitter. So do check him out and give him a follow because he is fantastic fun and like I said, one of the best communicators of science that I know. As we look into the future, I can only thank you for your continued support of the podcast. 
things are going well. Our last episode with George Holt on the B-58 is causing some controversy, but is going nuts on Instagram. So do check that out. If you'd like to support the pod, please like it, subscribe it, put some stars into your podcast app of choice. Just tell your friends it's going well. Our wonderful sponsors at the Pima Air and Space Museum are continuing with their support. We're going to be heading out there in the new year. So if you want something specific filmed, drop me a line, put a note in the comments and we can do that. Of course, if you want to join us on Patreon, become a damn Castier, you can from just three pounds a month, plus a spot of that. That all goes to help to keep these things going, paying for all of the stuff and microphones and things. But we know times are tough. Tell your friends. That's the best way to keep things going. So until next time, thank you ever so much for your support. You are all wonderful. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Do take care of yourselves. Bye-bye. The Damcasters is hosted and produced by Matt Bone and is a Boney Abroad podcast production. To learn more about our podcast and check out our previous episodes, head to www.thedamcasterspod.com.